you know a guy named Scott Hamilton. How many of you heard that name? All right. If you are younger, Scott Hamilton won the gold in the Winter Olympics um, ice skating. And, and Scott's only like 5'4 or something like that. And, well, let's see Scott's story because it's amazing what God does in Scott's life. He did not know Christ when he won gold. Josh? I don't think anyone's truly equipped to go out in front of a billion, two billion, three billion people on an Olympic stage, and you're scared out of your mind. On a 200 by 100 surface of ice, you wonder why you do this because you're so nervous. On two 10 inch lengths of quarter inch wide steel, through this, just get me through this. And you're to manipulate those edges for four and a half minutes and do triple jumps and athleticism and not make a mistake. It's impossible. But I found a way to be just, just good enough <laughs> to win the gold medal. The more I look back on it, I think it's unbelievably awesome. Like, that was me. You know, I always thought if I could be really good on the ice, you know, I could become famous. <laughs> I, I think I'm probably more known for my health problems now than I am for anything I ever did um, on skates. When I was very little, I suffered from a disease that stopped me from growing. It was in and out of hospitals for years and I was never really home. And so what ended up happening was I came back from kind of being in and out of hospitals and I ended up going to the skating club thing just by accident. And I found skating, which kind of took on a life of its own and, and it progressed and pretty soon I'm competing, pretty soon I'm living away from home. All my role models and, and the people that were teaching me how to live day to day were older skaters. So there was a lot of it that was terrific, but a lot of it that really um, wasn't guiding me in, in any real direction. It wasn't until I suffered the devastation of my mother losing her battle to cancer that something was awakened in me. I knew I needed something more, something better. I think I needed to have uh, some strength. and. My mother um, was my source of strength. When she was living, I would disappoint her. But when she, when she was gone, I, I just didn't ever want to be less than she thought I could be. I was happy to just work. I was happy to just entertain. I do well, and I think that was that was good enough. Skating had given me life as a child, and it given me, you know, kind of a strength as an adult. But what was about to happen uh, really changed my life forever. You know, cancer it put me into a phase of my life where I just needed to kind of sort it all out. I just survived something. Why? I, I survived something that took the most important person in my life off the planet. That was my mother. She died of cancer and I survived. What's my purpose now? What, what do I need to do? What, how do I? And a big part of that dust settling was getting with Tracy. And she brought me to the church. She took me to a minister, a man named Ken Durham. And the first thing he, he said to me, which was, was extraordinary, was he goes, you have to understand that Christianity is, is a faith of history. These things actually happened. And I go, okay, that's a good starting off point. And just study what has happened and, and see how that resonates in your own life. And it grew, it just sort of, it's like, okay, I get it. When you survive testicular cancer um, and you want to start a family, you don't know what the issues are going to be. And um, I prayed that I, I would someday become a father. Tracy and I, we got engaged and married 
And then my son was born nine months and two days after we got married. <laughs> so I guess there was a plan there. I thought I paid my health dues when I had cancer, but this was a whole nother issue. Uh, I have a brain tumor. How do I tell my wife? And we have a 14 month old son. How do I, how do I tell my wife that I have a brain tumor? I just gotten the news an hour before. I met them at the hotel and I, she goes, what's going on? And I said, I have a brain tumor. And she took my hands and without hesitation, she just started to pray. And it was in that moment I knew where I was going to put everything. My trust, my faith, everything. So the most powerful moment of my life. From that moment forward, we just said, whatever it is, whatever it takes, we'll face this. When they're gonna do a biopsy, they tell you, we're gonna drill a hole in your head, and then we're gonna take um, a needle down through your brain and take a piece of the tumor. <laughs> they said, we seem to have found a safe corridor <laughs> to do this. And I go, well, I'm not using most of it, but um, they tell you all the things that can go wrong in that surgery. And I remember waking up and I looked at the clock and it was 1020. I knew where I was. And then the next thing I saw was my wife come in with a smile on her face. She said, they know what it is. And they, they found out that that brain tumor was one that I was born with, one that I'd had since birth, which inhibited my growth as a young child. That was the mysterious illness I had that they never diagnosed that got me into skating. Who would I be without a brain tumor? I'm five foot four. If I were five eight, if I would have grown those years, five ten, where would I be? Who would I be? I could choose to look at it as debilitating, I could choose to focus on the suffering. I choose to look at that brain tumor as the greatest gift I could have gotten because it made everything else possible. I didn't see past it this time. I didn't think I would survive. One point I was starting to really feel weak. And one nurse in particular, I was up at three o'clock in the morning and I just was uncomfortable. And she was, can, can I get you anything? And I, I just said, no. I go, I'm just a little scared. And she said, do you pray? I said, Yes. And she said, what do you say when you pray? I go, well, I just, I just thank God for all the blessings in my life. Do you ask him for anything? No. I just, I just want him to know I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Well, who is God to you? And I said, well, I, I guess he's, he's my father. Oh, you're a father, right? Yes. If one of your children were hurting, wouldn't you want him to come to you for comfort and strength? Yes. So I change the way I pray now. I ask. Uninhibitedly, I ask. I ask to heal. I ask for strength. I ask for courage. I ask for another child. I want to talk about miracles. So after surviving the pituitary brain tumor, it's impossible, practically impossible. I did six injections a week for two years. No luck, we're not meant to have another child. We gave that to God. A month later, 
we found out that Max was on his way. Miracle Max. When I look back and I see all those little moments in my life where I needed a great deal of strength, I understand that through a strong relationship with Jesus, you can endure anything. I just learned that the only true disability in life is a bad attitude. God is there to guide you through the tough spots. God was there every single time. <laughs> every single time. My name is Scott Hamilton, and I am second. To speak to us. Incidentally, did you hear that important statement that Scott said? The only true disability is a bad attitude. Hmm. Hmm. So as we're trying to do our questions series, questions for God, today we're, uh, guess what we're dealing with? Pain, suffering. And um, it, it, this is one of those interesting ones because um, the last few weeks, oh my goodness, have I been in pain. <laughs> I think my back's getting worse. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be healed after a year or so of hitting a tree, right? <laughs> you know, the, and, and oh my, uh, there, I, there's times I'll try to stand up and just big jolts of pain just hit me in the back. And uh, I was thinking about that this week that, um, you know, this is one of those messages that I think God has for all of us, and, and, and you know, it's really helpful when the message is also for the pastor. <laughs> Why does God allow pain and suffering? <laughs> Why does he allow stupid bicycle riders to run into a tree at 40 miles an hour? <laughs> okay, well, because he, if he stopped all of us from all of our stupid stuff, well, then <laughs> he'd have to stop all evil, all sin, and he ends it all. And when he ends it all, then everyone goes to heaven. That knows him. And it's a dividing point in history that God is still unwilling to, 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 to stop. Because when he stops all evil, when he stops all pain and suffering, there are those that God loves who will not be with him in heaven. You see, it's God's love. And it wasn't he who caused it. If you look back at Genesis 3, and, and actually let's look a little farther back, Genesis 1 and 2, God created everything good. There wasn't pain and suffering. Guess what, guys? We didn't have to pull weeds. We didn't have the pain of work. Ladies, I don't know how it was going to happen, but birth wasn't going to hurt. <laughs> okay? And unfortunately... Um, and if you had been Adam and Eve, you would have done it too, okay? So don't be too holy now. Um, you would have wanted to know more. You would have heard that, that temptation of, you know, if you um, eat from this tree, you know, you're going to know stuff that God knows. Really? Wow. And what well, they didn't realize that they were up against the great accuser of the brethren, that they are up against the one who had already been expelled from heaven, and the only way he was going to get what he thought he could get, and that was the reign and rule over this earth, was to get mankind to relinquish it to him. And how did they do that? By sin, which is what we continue to do. So today, how, why does God allow pain and suffering? <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 12 Verses 6 through 10. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. <laughs> I gotta just pause there for a minute. 
Paul starts this section here, and, and there's, he's in a whole conversation where he's been talking to the Corinthians about their behavior and, and even defending his own ministry and all. And, and now he's going to kind of like brag a little bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> he says, okay, if I start going off bragging, oh, man, I'm going to go really bad at this. I'm going to really talk about a whole bunch of stuff and all. And you know what? Guess what? We'll read on. to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I hope some of you are getting it because I don't know that I have yet. It's oftentimes when, when we're weakest is when then we, we either complain or we try to struggle through, we take a pill, whatever it might be, right? <laughs> to try to get, get through that weakness. I think it was Tony who reminded me of the story of Richard Wormbrand this week, the founder of Voice of the Martyrs. And Wormbrand was uh, locked up for, what was it, several years, like 14, 14 years that he was actually in prison. And he describes his incarceration. He was in there because he was a believer. That's all, because he was a Christian, because he was a pastor and all. And so he's, he describes the place where he was. He was in this prison cell, and it was gray, and it was silent. They, they, they had put sound barriers up around so that they couldn't hear anything else. So you couldn't even have the communication like you did with some prisons and stuff like the Vietnam vets talked about. And he said, and he talked about how challenging it was for his faith. And, and one day as he was, and he had been, he was tortured. They, they barely had much to eat, sometimes only one piece of bread during a week. I mean, this man went through some terrible, terrible times. Think about this, 14 years, silence. He said, the room was all gray. We were in gray clothing. There was no color, Nothing. And he said, one day he was praying. He said, God, I don't, have, I don't have your word. I don't have any brothers or sisters here with me. I, I don't have anything. And he, says, I, and he was really struggling with trying to get through it. And he said, God asked him, what is your name? And he thought about it, you know, how am I going to answer? Because his, his name's Richard. And he recalled that Richard was the name of a man who had been killed for his faith. And that this Richard was such a gentle man that as he was up there waiting on the gallows to be hung, the hangman couldn't get the knot uh, loose enough to put it down over his head. So Richard says, you know, I'm a farmer. I know how to work with things like this. Would you allow me to help you? And Richard actually helps the man who's going to hang him to loosen the knot and to set it up so that it can go over his neck and kill him. And as he's then doing that, he looks to the man, looks him in the face, he says, I don't. He says, I don't hold this against you, please. I understand this is not your fault. And then with a smile on his face, Richard dies for Jesus. Wormbrand says, I, I couldn't say my name was Richard because he says, I'm not a man like that, Richard. I thought about it, he said, Richard goes on, he says, I thought about it. maybe I'd, I'd say I was Christian. But he said, I remembered how the Christians suffered and died for their faith and that's why they were called Christ ones because they were willing to suffer and die. And he says, I, don't, I don't, wasn't sure I wanted to do that either. And so finally, Richard says, as he was talking with God, he said, Jesus, I have no, I have no name. Allow me to bear your name. For I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
Uh, Wormbrand, as you know, now has started Voice of the Martyrs, an incredible ministry that's trying to minister to those who are suffering and being tortured around the world. And there are thousands of them who are dying for Jesus Christ right now. Why does God allow the suffering and pain of his beloved, of his children? Why? Could it be that God is trying to accomplish something bigger than what we can see? maybe even through our pain and suffering. Jason Malik said, in other words, a good God may not eliminate pain and suffering from the world because they are used to accomplish, used to accomplish meaningful ends. Let's face it. If this was a hot table, burning hot like a stove, and I put my hand on it, what would pain tell me? Pain would say, "Youch, jerk that hand off of there. And without the pain, I wouldn't know to pull that hand off of there. So God, even in the way he's now created our bodies, has given us insight that we can use for our good and for his purposes. C.S. Lewis, in The Problem of Pain, said, the fact of suffering undoubtedly constitutes the single greatest challenge to the Christian faith. What did Paul say? When I am weak, then I am strong. We sang it already. Did you hear it? There's pain in the offering. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It can actually hurt to give of ourselves to God, can't it? There's pain in the offering. Did you, did you hear it in Scott's story as he's testifying to these various experiences and you're kind of listening, oh my goodness, a tumor and, and just gesticular cancer and couldn't grow as a little kid and mom dies again. And, wow, how much more? Can't have baby. Oh, oh, Lord. And then he says what? He says, without that tumor, which came back six years later, remember? And now he has to learn about What? He's really learning finally about just letting God love him. But what was it? That, that tumor was what kept him short <laughs> and got him into ice skating. It's, it's, a, it's a modern parable of what Joseph said, what man meant for evil when his brothers sold him into slavery, fortunately, but instead of killing him. When they sold him into slavery, God sent him to Egypt and he used the slavery as the as the 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 bus ticket, if you will, (laughs) to get him to Egypt where he could get in a position by the power of God to become ruler, leader in that nation and set up a place for the children of Israel to go and rest for a time. Eventually then Moses would come and take him out of bondage, but, but Joseph got there by God working through the evil even of his brothers and Pharaoh. I like my version of the New International Bible, um, and if any of you could see it, uh, you don't need to see what's written, but if you look closely, can anyone see the color that's there by my finger? What is it? It's red, yes. Does anybody know why there's red letters in a Bible? Because they're supposed to be the words of Jesus. And verse 9 says, but he said to me in red letters, which means Jesus talking to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, how many of you pray for weakness? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) I don't even think Paul, frankly, prayed for it. But what he knew was is that was in those moments of weakness, that's when he would turn to God. And because that's when he would turn to God, not that's when he was strong, but that's when he would become strong because of the power of God. When we are weak, that's when maybe we're most ready. Isn't anybody who's had an addiction, don't you have to hit bottom? you got to come to a place of just admitting, oh, 
and seeing everything's bad and you're like, you know, you may have lost almost everything around you, the marriage and everything else. And you think, oh no, you might even be in a prison cell. And you're like, oh, what's going to happen to me now? And maybe finally now you'll cry out to God and say, God, help me. And that's what Paul is coming to understand. In his weakness, he is becoming strong. Yes, that's when he's looking to God himself. There's um, four things I'd like to point out from this and have you think about. Number one, God wants humility. Matthew 23, 12 says, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles, humbles himself will be exalted. We have been learning that one of the issues that can divide and, and hurt churches is pride and ego. It's one of the places, things that we're vulnerable to right here, right, Tony? We are, we are so vulnerable to, as we stand in front, pastors as well, okay? This is not just you guys, but anyone who's standing in front, we are so vulnerable to getting a bigger ego, to wanting the praise of people, and pride will ruin us and pull us away from God. And isn't that maybe some of what was happening to Satan is he kind of wants what God's getting as God's getting praise. He wants that. And Lucifer will will eventually be thrown out of heaven because of it as he seeks something else. And isn't pride seeking something that that we just need to let alone? Humility. if if, If you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus said in Luke 18, but the tax collector stood at a distance and he's describing this parable and it's really, it's a situation he's watching probably right there in the temple and he sees two people praying. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted because the other man stood over there and said, thank you God, I'm not like him. And it was the tax collector who said, oh Lord, I, I, don't, I don't have any right to be here. All I know is, is I'm hurting and I need you. But when I am weak, then I am strong. It's Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he did what? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. God wants humility. You see, until you humble yourself, you're not going to come to the mighty hand of God and say, help. God wants humility. Secondly, God wants brokenness. Psalm 51, 15 says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are what? Listen carefully. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Well, Psalmist continues, he says in Psalm 143, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. And now notice when he's talking about the broken heart, he's not, he's talking about somebody who's wounded and hurting and in need. And he says, God is going to heal that person. It's kind of what Jesus was saying, and that blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are hurting. And I don't need to not say, stay too long in this verse because we're going to come back to it in a few weeks when we talk some more about death. But God comforts and ministers to those who are in pain and hurting, especially when they will humble themselves before him. God wants brokenness. And it is about attitude, isn't it? Thirdly, God wants to give us his power. God wants to empower us with stuff straight from the throne room of heaven. Philippians 4, 12 says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And what's the secret? 
You, get, you hear what Paul's saying? He said, look, and he's been out there. He's been shipwrecked. He's been, he's been stoned. He's been put in prison. He's been whipped and tortured and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they've tried to kill him multiple times and it hasn't worked. And he says, I've learned the secret, how to be content in all of this. And here's the secret. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the secret. God wants to give us his power. James says it this way, but he gives us more grace. Thank you, Jesus. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. (laughs) Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, (coughs) excuse me, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up. It's when we come to him. Not when we know we're going to do it on our own. Because see, we, we Americans, we're just so confident, right? We're self-made people. We've got all this energy and all this ability. And so we're going to go out there and make it on our own. And he says, no, but when you come to me, when you humble yourself to me, that's when I will lift you up. God wants to give us his power. And fourthly, folks, I know you think that you can do it. I know you think you've got wealth, you've got resources, you're tough, you can handle this. But God's strength is all we need. Hebrews says it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet, was without sin. You may want to pause there for a minute. What's your attitude? Scott said attitude. It's all about attitude. What's your attitude about life and things that you're facing? Are you tempted to grumble and gripe and complain and grouse and dissent and all that other stuff. (laughs) You think Jesus was tempted too? Uh, It says he was tempted in every way just like us. Are you ever tempted just to forget it? I'll take that drink. It'll help me get over it. I'll just go out there and have that eating binge and then I'll feel better. I mean, are you tempted to try to use something else? Do you think Jesus was? Tempted in every way, just as we are. You ever get mean and nasty and just kind of unkind because of what you're feeling? (laughs) And take it out on somebody else? Isn't that a sin? Do you think Jesus was ever tempted to take it out on somebody else? Tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's not that hard to face temptation and give in. To have faced temptation and never given in, that is only done by the incredible, awesome power of God, and that's the power he wants to make available to us because he sympathizes with us in our weakness. And then let's go on. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Because he understands, he invites us to come to him. Second Corinthians goes on this way. He says, for to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And Paul kind of threw that last little piece in there in kind of a strange kind of way, didn't he? 
He says, don't you know that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. How can you fail the test? You fail the test by not having Jesus there. It's something that has to happen with your heart, not just your head. It's not an intellectual thing. It is a faith thing. Where you have to come to a place where you say, Jesus, I need you. And I'm going to turn my life over to you. And you see, if you've never done that, it doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter what kinds of things you do, how great your attitude is. If you've never done that, what Paul just said is you failed the test. So I would invite you today, if you've never done that, to do it. How do you do it? You know, we could go put, put people through all kinds of a rigmarole and all, everything, right? And, and you have to follow this step and do this thing and this right here and all like this. And, and Jesus, when he talked to his disciples, he said, come follow me. And they said, okay. It was a heart response, though, that took action then afterwards. So if you've never done it, say, okay. And then take action and start following him, becoming like him. Well, you've heard about Johnny Erickson Tata, haven't you? Anybody been watching about the, the, the Emmys or whatever it was? The uh, nomination of, of a song. I, I want to take you back a number of years in Johnny's life. She says, I think life is supposed to be difficult. A lot of life is grabbing your leg by the calf. Johnny Erickson Tata, at 16 years old, had a diving accident. It's crippled from the neck down. Okay. <laughs> when she did this song that they had nominated... It's a beautiful song, by the way. Um, alone and Not Alone, I believe it's called. And there's a movie named after that. It's coming out in April or something like that. Um, she, her husband <laughs> has to hold her diaphragm, hold, hold her like this so the air can go up so she can sing the song. It's amazing. Anyways, back to the, what she said. A lot of life is grabbing your leg by the calf, jerking it out of the earth. <laughs> she literally has to do that. Putting it down in front of you, and she can't do it with her hands, so somebody else has to do it, and going forward. With my disability, some days are easier than others, but for me, life is always difficult. These are issues I must face every single morning. Every morning, somebody has to give me a bath in bed, dress me, lift me into a wheelchair, comb my hair, brush my teeth, fix my breakfast, cut up my food, and feed me. When it comes to the day-to-day -day routines of dealing with the paralysis, at worst, it's depressing. At best, it's boring. I can't live with those flat facts. I have to turn them by God's grace into something that has meaning and purpose. Why does God allow pain and suffering? Because there's some meaning and purpose that he's gonna try to accomplish through it. As he did with Christ on the cross, as he did with Joseph, as he did with Paul, and as he promises to do for us if, if, <laughs> if, we will be humble, allow ourselves to be broken, come to him for his power, and seek his strength. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God. I confess that for the person who's in deep pain, that no intellectual statement can take away that pain. And that even trying to explain some reason why something has happened will never meet the inner longings that we have. But there is something that will, God, and you've shown it to us right here, that if we will turn to you, that in, in, in the admission of our weakness and our need, that if our hearts will open up to your strength, you will give us that strength for when we are weak. That's 
when we become strong. For your grace is made perfect in weakness. So God, I pray for anyone who's in pain here today that you would put your arm around them and that you would invite them to embrace your love, your comfort, your peace, and allow you to give them strength. Lord God, I pray that you would give them insight into how you're going to accomplish something through their pain. Lord, I thank you that you've given us bodies that can feel and taste and smell and, and breathe and, and enjoy and live. And that with these bodies, Lord, that as they reach older age, as they go through various experiences, oh Lord, that we're coming to a place of decay and sometime we're gonna go into heaven. And Lord God, I pray that you would take some of the fear of that moment away and replace it with the joy, with the anticipation of something that is incredibly better, something that is so much more special that it's almost incomprehensible, that you've said you're going there and to prepare a place for us, that wherever you are there, we will be with you. Oh God, I pray that the reality of that place and the joy of being in your presence will carry us through these days, however long they might be, whatever pain we might experience, whatever suffering we might go through. Lord, I pray that you would draw us closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team.